Hello, Pray and Share Workers. How are y'all doing tonight? I have special effects on both cameras tonight. And uh, I upgraded my camera and I am not real happy with the results. So maybe I'm just not smart enough to figure out the effects for the camera, but I want this camera to look like that camera. And they do not. Anyway. It is going to be okay. I hope you had an awesome Friday. I did. I went and got groceries. And yesterday, I decorated for Christmas. So that was good. That was so good. If that's already done, most of my Christmas presents are already here. It's very unusual for me. But anyway, I am very excited about it. I think both of my cameras are behind. Okay, so if we watch this and the cameras are not synced, then I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, well, tonight we are going to do Psalms 57 and 58. And like I said, we're about a quarter of the way, really more than a quarter of the way through Psalms. And then when we get through Psalms, we will do something else. But my name is Charm, and this is my channel for YouTube, <laughs> Awesome Treasures Ministry, and my page for Facebook, Awesome Treasures Ministry. And so, um, anyway, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are going to begin in prayer. Then we're going to read our scripture. I kind of wanted to read my quiet time for today, but I left it over there in the corner. So we just won't do that. So anyway, tomorrow is Saturday. And I am going to an open house in the morning. I have to get up really early and get out of here. I have to go and get some stuff before I go. Anyway, let's pray. God, we just thank you. We just come to you and we thank you, God, for all the many things that you do for us. We, um, we just praise you, God, that you are on the throne and you are in control. And there is nothing that you do not know that you do not see, God, and that you do not know all the details, all the solutions, and all the outcomes, God. We trust fully in you. Thank you for being our creator. Thank you for being our sustainer, our protector, our provider, our shelter in the storm. Thank you for being our strength and our refuge. God, you are mighty and magnificent and powerful. And you are the righteous judge that will judge all unrighteousness according to your truth. But God, you are also caring and loving and compassionate, trustworthy, faithful, forgiving, God, and patient. You want none to perish. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for calling us as your children. We love you with our whole heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. God, we just pray for the lost. We just pray that you would open their eyes and their ears and their hearts to the truth, that you would allow the Holy Spirit to draw them to Jesus so that they can be saved. We pray for the prodigals, God, to remember the relationship that they once had with you and to return and to repent and to be reconciled. God, all the many things that are going on today, we pray, we just pray for all these things, God, all these things that have happened the past two weeks. We pray for parents that were involved, God. We just pray for peace, comfort, and strength, and friends and family members, God. We pray for people that have been injured. We just pray for healing, God. We pray for healing for the communities, for peace, comfort, and strength for the communities. God, we pray for people that are in the path of 
strong storms tonight, tornadic storms in Kentucky and Tennessee and many other places, God. We just pray that you would be with them, that you would protect them, that you would keep them safe, God. We just praise you and thank you, God, that we can lay everything at your feet and that you will attend to it according to your will and your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, I'm not liking my upgrade on my camera, but we're just going to have to move on from that. Maybe I can contact them and go, hey, my camera is no better. Like, what is going on? Or maybe I'll work with it in a minute, and maybe I missed something. I don't know, but it looks like the same thing to me. Maybe just a few more things that I can do with it, but I mean, it needs to be clearer and it needs to be, uh, my eyes are not blue. It looks like my eyes are blue. My eyes are green. My eyes are green as green as green can be. My eyes look blue. All right. 57 and 58. 57 is prayer for safety from enemies to the chief musician set to do not destroy the mention of David when he fled from Saul into the cave. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for my soul trusts in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed away. I will cry out to God most high. God who performs all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me. He reproaches one who would swallow me up. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. My soul is among lions. I lie among the sons of men who are set on fire, whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have dug a pit before me. In the midst of it, they themselves have fallen. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise. Awake my glory. Awake lute and harp. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations, for your mercy reaches unto the heavens, and your truth unto the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. So again, King David, being pursued by Saul and by his enemies, but God is who he trusts. He trusts. His soul trusts in God. And he finds refuge in the shadow of God's wings. Oh, he will praise God among the nations. So again, a psalm of running from his enemies but yet trusting God. I see, I see a pattern with David and God. David runs from his enemies, but he trusts God in all things. We need to trust God in all things. Um, okay, so this is the study part of this. The poet began... <clears throat> Excuse me. The poet began with a cry for mercy from God in whom he trusted. Using lovely imagery to describe taking refuge in the shadow of God's wings until the storms have passed, the heading associates associates this poem with a time when David escaped from King Saul 
into a cave in the wilderness of Engedi. I don't know. Either his escape to the cave of Adullam or the encounter at the rocks of the wild goats where he could have killed Saul. The psalmist had experienced the actions of God in his behalf in the past and was thus confident of his deliverance from present difficulties. God is to be exalted for his glory. So again, David, David had been in this relationship with God for a while, so he knew, he knew he could trust God, and he knew that he could call out to God, and that God would protect him. All right, so let's move on to Psalm 58, the just judgment of the wicked. Do you indeed speak righteousness? Oh. To the chief musician set to do not destroy a Mitchum of David. Excuse me, I had dinner a while ago. Do you indeed speak righteousness, you silent ones? Do you judge uprightly, you sons of men? No, in heart you work wickedness. You weigh out the violence of your hands in the earth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf cobra that stops its ears, which will not heed the voice of charmers, charming ever so skillfully. Break their teeth in their mouth, O God. Break out the fangs of the young lions, O Lord. Let them flow away as waters which run continually. When he bends his bow, let his arrows be as if cut in pieces. Let them be like a, a snail which melts away as it goes, like a stillborn child of a woman that they may not see the sun. Before your pots can feel the burning thorns, he shall take them away as with a whirlwind, as in his living and burning wrath. The righteous shall rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked, so that men will say, Surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely he is God who judges in the earth. So that's kind of a, it's kind of anger. I was reading down here, it says the psalmist expressed anger. He is very anger, angry about the uh, unrighteous that are around him, the wickedness that he sees. Um, and is asking God to, I guess, pour out his wrath on them. But then he ends it with, the righteous shall be rewarded. The righteous shall rejoice when he sees the vengeance. Surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely he is God who judges in the earth. And God is going to judge the earth. He is going to judge the unrighteousness. So if you look around and see all the unrighteousness that is going on, God is going to judge it. So we want to be on the side of righteous. We want to be standing with God. We want to be walking with Jesus. We want to walk in God's ways and not the ways of the world. We want to turn away from the ways of the world and walk in God's ways. Because that's where our blessing is. Our blessings are in God. He is the one who blesses. And he wants us, he calls us to not be of the world. We have to live in the world until God takes us, or until Jesus comes to get us. But we do not have to be of the world, which means we don't have to accept the world's sin as our sin that we are going to partake in. We need to stay separate from that. 
We need to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That is how we need to walk. We need to walk in that. So... That is, oh, I'm sorry. We'll see what the psalmist says. We'll see what the study part says. The psalmist expressed anger over the apparent lack of judgment on the wicked, yet asserted that there is a God who judges the earth. The wicked devise evil from birth, and there is never evidence of good in their hearts. The problem confronted by the psalmist appears similar to the question raised in the book of Job. Why do the righteous suffer and the wicked continue in prosperity? The poet ended the psalm with certainty that the score would be evened out in the end. God is the righteous judge who will reward the faithful and bring vengeance on the wicked. And so that's so true. That's just what we were talking about. That God is the righteous judge, and God is going to judge people according to his word. He's not going to ask people, well, what is your truth? What do you think truth is? It's going to be according to his truths. He is the creator. He is the creator of all mankind, righteous and unrighteous. All nations. All races. He created all. And he created all to further his kingdom. He created all to live out the plan and purpose that he has in their lives. Not what they think is right for their lives, but what God wants for us. I'm sorry, my camera is so messed up tonight. Even my other one is lagging tonight. I don't know what's wrong with it. Maybe it's the effects. Maybe the effects make them worse. I don't know. All right. Well, that concluded our reading time. Although I was sitting here thinking I wanted to read Matthew 24. But maybe not tonight. I have read Matthew 24 before. I found this with my Christmas decorations. So I found another, yet another track that I can use to share the salvation message. 10 Reasons Jesus Came to Die. And this is by John Piper, which I like John Piper. He's a great, great preacher. Okay, so it starts with 10. Why did Jesus Christ suffer and die? I believe that is the most important question of the 21st century. Here are 10 answers from the Bible. Jesus came to die. Number 10, to destroy hostility between races. Wow, we just talked about that, that God created all races. God created all nations. Um, to destroy hostility between races. A suspicion, prejudice, and demeaning attitudes between Jews and non-Jews in Bible times were as serious as the racial, ethnic, and national hostilities today. Jesus died to create a whole new way for races to be reconciled. He has broken down the dividing wall of hostility, making peace through the cross. Ephesians 2.14 16. It is impossible to build lasting unity among races by saying that all religions can come together as equally valid. God sent his son into the world as the only means of saving sinners and reconciling races. Only as the races find this reconciliation well, they love and enjoy each other. And that is so true. People can live in unity if they love like Jesus, if they can love each other like Jesus. Even agree to disagree about things. You can still love and you can still live in unity. 
So number nine, to give marriage its deepest meaning. God's design was never for marriages to be miserable, yet many are. That's what sin does. It makes us treat each other badly. Jesus died to change that. He knew that his suffering would make the deepest meaning of marriage plain. That's why the Bible says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Ephesians 5, 25. God's design for marriage is for a husband to love his wife the way Christ loves his people and for the wife to respond the way Christ's people should. This kind of love is possible because Christ died for both husband and wife. So number eight, to absorb the wrath of God. We talked about the wrath of God. We talked about the vengeance of God. We talked about that God is the righteous judge. God's law demanded you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Deuteronomy 6, 5. But we have all loved other things more. This is what sin is. Dishonoring God by preferring other things over him and acting on those preferences. The seriousness of an insult rises with the dignity of the one insulted. Since our sin is against the ruler of the universe, the wages of our sin is death. Not to punish it would be unjust. So God sent his own son, Jesus, to divert sin's punishment from us to himself. God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the wrath-absorbing substitute for our sins, 1 John 4.10. Then God publicly endorsed Christ's accomplishment by raising him from the dead, proving the success of his suffering and death. So number seven, so that we would escape the curse of the law. There was no escape from the curse of God's law. It was just we were guilty. There was only one way to be free. Someone must pay the penalty. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Galatians 3.13 The law's demands have been fulfilled by Christ's perfect law-keeping, its penalty fully paid by his death. This is why the Bible teaches that getting right with God is not based on law-keeping. A person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Galatians 2.16 Our only hope is having the blood and righteousness of Christ credited to our account. So number six is to reconcile us to God. The reconciliation that needs to happen between man and God goes both ways. God's first act in reconciling us to himself was to remove the obstacle that separated him from us, the guilt of our sin. He took the steps we could not take to remove his own judgment by sending Jesus to suffer in our place. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Romans 5.10 Reconciliation from our side is simply to receive what God has already done. The way we receive an infinitely valuable To show God's love for sinners is number five. The measure of God's love is shown by the degree of his sacrifice in saving us from the penalty of our sins. He gave his only son, John 3, 16. When we add the horrific crucifixion that Christ endured, it becomes clear that the sacrifice the Father and the Son made to save us was indescribably great. The measure of his love increases still more when we consider the degree of our unworthiness. God shows his love for us in that 
While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8, our debt is so great, only a divine sacrifice could pay for it. Number four, to show Jesus' own love for us. The death of Christ is also the supreme expression that he loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2, 20, it is my sin that cuts me off from God. All I can do is plead for mercy. I see Christ suffering and dying to give his life as a ransom for many. Matthew twenty twenty eight. And I ask, am I among the many? And I hear the answer, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John three sixteen. Jesus paid the highest price possible to give me personally the greatest gift possible. So number three, to take away our condemnation. The great conclusion to the suffering and death of Christ is this. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 1. To be in Christ means to be in relationship to him by faith. Christ becomes our punishment, which we don't have to bear, and our worth before God, which we cannot earn. The death of Christ secures freedom from condemnation for those who believe that Christ has served their death sentence. It is as sure as they cannot be condemned as it is sure that Christ died. Number two, to bring us to God. Gospel means good news, and it all ends in one thing, in God himself. The gospel is the good news that at the cost of his son's life, God has done everything necessary to captivate us with what will make us eternally and ever increasingly happy, namely himself. Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. 1 Peter 3.18 And then the number one is to give eternal life to all who believe on him. Jesus made it plain that rejecting the eternal life he offered would result in the misery of eternity in hell. Whoever does not believe is condemned already. The wrath of God remains on him. John three eighteen and 36. But for those who trust Christ, the best is yet to come. No eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. We will see the all-satisfying glory of God. This is eternal life. They that know, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. John 17, 3. For all these reasons and more, Christ suffered and died. Why would you not embrace him as your savior from sin and judgment and live with God eternally? If you are moved to embrace God's son in this way, tell God in words like these. So I'm going to say this prayer. And um, if you would like to repeat this prayer and be saved through Jesus, God's one and only son, then repeat after me. Dear God, I am convinced that Jesus suffered and died for my sins. I gratefully trust in him now as my Lord and my precious treasure and the only way I'll ever receive your forgiveness. and your promise of eternal life. In Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Sorry, something. I got a prayer request on my phone as I was sitting here.
I'm going to lift that lady up in prayer when we pray. All right. Well, if you invited Jesus to be your Savior, then welcome to the kingdom family of God. Angels are rejoicing, and your name is being written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You are now saved, sealed, and sanctified by God through Jesus Christ, His Son. If you want to grow closer to God, then read His Word every day. Read the Bible every day. Pray to God every day. And praise God. Be thankful. Be grateful for what you have. Follow Jesus' example by being baptized. Pray for God to lead you to a church so you can have a church family to um, learn, to fellowship with, to worship with. All right. Well, it is time for me to get off of here. So I'm going to give you God's blessing. We're going to pray. Not sure if I'm going to be here tomorrow night. I probably will be. Um, I'm going up balloons for a baby shower on Sunday. I don't know what I'm going to be doing. Uh, this blessing is from God in Numbers 6 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. Give you peace. So we all need peace this day and time. Okay. People in my church family need prayers. So I'm going to lift them up to you. I'm going to pray. If you have any prayer requests, please put them in the comments. If you have any comments, please put them in the comments. If you'd like to have this Bible study, sorry it's not nightly. I would like to be more consistent, but it's just not right now. Then please subscribe. I do give you about 30 minutes to know that I am coming on um, on Facebook. I don't know how to do that on YouTube yet. I'm going to learn how, though. Um, let's pray. God, we just come to you, God, and I just lift up uh, these ladies to you right now, God. I pray for healing, I pray for whatever is going on in their life, God. You know all the details, God. I just pray that you would give them strength, God. You know the solutions, God. We trust you in the solutions and the outcome. God, like David, we know that you are our strength and our refuge. We thank you for that. And we do trust you with everything that we have, God. We just pray that you would give us the boldness to go out to share your truths and to share the gospel of Jesus. I pray for all of my family and all of my friends, God. And people that come on here, God, that I don't know, that are my sisters and brothers or my potential sisters and brothers, God, I pray for them and their families too. I pray for protection and provision and blessings, God, that uh, they would feel your presence every day. I pray for the sick, God. I just pray that you would give them strength, that you would heal their bodies. Pray for the people that have lost loved ones. There's been so much loss lately, God. I just pray for these families, for these friends, God, for peace, comfort, and strength, and that you would heal them, God, that they would Feel your presence, God, that they would be drawn closer to you during this time. All these tragedies, all these senseless tragedies that have happened, God, I pray for these people too. I just pray, God, that they would feel your presence, that this is supposed to be a season of celebration and a season of happiness. Many of them do not have their family members to celebrate with, God, so I pray that you would replace that absence that they have with others, God, that there would be people that would come to meet them in their time of sadness, God. That they would be attended to by the hands and feet of Jesus, the loving compassion of Jesus. We just praise you and thank you, God, for all the many blessings that you've bestowed upon us, for all the many things that you do for us. 
protecting us, God, for providing for us, for creating us as your children. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, I'm going to get off of here. I hope you have an awesome rest of your night and an awesome tomorrow. Please pray for me. I'm driving to a neighboring town tomorrow. My car is not running the way that it should. Partly my fault for not doing the maintenance on it, but still. Makes me a little apprehensive to get in my car and take off by myself. So that is what I'm going to do tomorrow. I'm going to a grand opening, my daughter's grand opening. I'm very proud of her. All the hard work that she has done in her dance studio. Built from the ground up. So anyway, that is what I'm doing tomorrow. So have an awesome rest of your night and an awesome tomorrow. And much love. Cyber hugs. Well, I see you again. Good night. Remember, Jesus loves you. And God loves you and treasures you above everything. Good night.